Hello and welcome to the lecture on neuromuscular blockade agents. This is a very unique category of medications that we use mostly in critical care medicine. They do use these for things like intubation, uh, so short-acting um, blockades. They also use these for general anesthesia as well to make sure you're not moving around during those surgical procedures. Uh, we're going to primarily focus on more of those intubations and critical care context for using these. Uh, think about your indications as you're going through this. Think about your side effects. Think about uh, short acting, long acting. Uh, is there a reversal agent? What's that reversal agent called if there is one? Uh, when would you reverse it? And then how do you assess how deep or how significant someone's paralytics are as well? How do you know if you're giving them enough paralysis versus too little? Uh, so these are things that you should be thinking about as you're listening to this or uh, at the end summarizing with those points. So let's get started. So we'll start out with key terms. Key terms include your, uh, that we're going to look at, is going to be acetylcholinesterase. This is an enzyme that breaks down. So this one breaks down the neurotransmitter ACH uh, at the synaptic cleft so that the next uh, nerve impulse can be transmitted across the synaptic gap. So this one we'll talk about in detail because what we can do here is we can affect the ability for this to uptake and they'll have a longer lasting paralytic effect. The next one that we'll look at here is amnesthetic properties, which means you're having the ability to cause total or partial loss of memory. So it is cruel to be paralyzed and aware. So that's where we usually use deep sedation or have amnesthetic properties on board during neuromuscular blockade uh, administration. Aspiration, which means the accidental inhalation of food, liquids, uh, or gastric contents into the lungs. It's one of our primary concerns we have to worry about, uh, especially when we're doing things like intubation where we're trying to get rid of a gag reflex. We need to make sure that we have the ability to avoid this, things like aspiration. Fasciculation, we've talked about this in critical care techniques. This is the involuntary contractions or twitching of groups of muscle fibers. Traditionally, we'll look at fasciculation of the eyes uh, with neuromuscular blockade administration to evaluate for the neuromuscular blockade being taken effect to then go ahead with the intubation. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder characterized by chronic fatigue and exhaustion of muscles, and we'll talk about what that has to do with this. And it, it is a disease process, obviously, uh, that will affect your neurotransmission. And then a nerve cell or a neuron is a basic functional unit of the nervous system that is specialized to transmit electrical nerve in impulses and carry information from one part of the body to another. So a neuron has the cell body, the axons, and the dendrites. The cell body, axons, and the dendrites. And that is just repeating stuff back from when you're in uh, AMP in science class. The neurotransmitter blocking agents, so this is what this whole thing is about, are substances that interfere with the neural transmission between motor and skeletal. So it's in between motor and skeletal muscles, motor neurons and skeletal muscles. So are we trying to paralyze cardiac muscle? Are we trying to paralyze smooth muscle? Well, we're trying to usually look at skeletal muscle for this, which, believe it or not, includes your diaphragm. So we got to make sure that we account for breathing on these patients. Neurotransmitters are chemicals that are released from a nerve ending to transmit an impulse from nerve cell to another nerve, a muscle, organ, or other tissue. Uh, nosocomial pneumonia is a pneumonia that's acquired in the healthcare setting. We gotta watch out, especially if we inhibit your ability to swallow or protect your airway. Uh, we can easily have a nosocomial pneumonia as part of that. And then sedation, which we just did a lecture on that. Sedation is pr uh, the production of a restful state of mind, particularly by the drugs that have a calming effect, relieving anxiety and tension. Uh, and then obviously sedation is gonna be hand in hand with paralytics because we usually don't paralyze 
uh, without sedation because you don't want to be paralyzed and aware of it as far as chemical paralytics are go. Uh, somatic nerve, ner motor neurons. Soma means body, right? And this is the part of the nervous system that controls muscles that are under voluntary control. So voluntary muscles, we're not talking about your cardiac muscle or anything else, but these are the voluntary muscles. Your status asthmaticus, which is where we can, I know it sounds like a, a Harry Potter thing, but it's not, uh, unless it is, I don't know. But uh, the status asthmaticus is a severe exacerbation of asthma that does not respond to standard treatment. And sometimes we will have to use neuromuscular blockade agents in this category of patients just to help us with uh, appropriate ventilation and oxygenation. It's status epilepticus. Uh, that means you have at least 30 minutes of a continuous seizure. 30 minutes of a continuous seizure activity without full recovery between seizures. So could that patient respond to paralytics, phenobarbital, things like that? Oh, absolutely, right? But let's start with a review of the somatic nervous system. So the somatic nervous system uh, is the peripheral nervous system, which is the autonomic branch. Uh, and it has your motor or somatic nerve, uh, neurons. And these ones are the ones that are voluntary, right? That you can control by thinking about them. Uh, they affect ske striated skeletal muscles, striated skeletal muscles. And then they have what's called nicotinic receptor sites. Uh, so this is going to be important knowing that there are nicotinic receptor sites when we start talking about the medications here in a little bit. Uh, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is the primary neurotransmitter in here. And acetylcholine is broken down by acetylcholinesterase, right? It eats it up, right? Uh, so that's what breaks down uh, acetylcholine. And the skeletal muscle is just your different striated skeletal muscles, the, the same muscles that you find in your triceps, your massive biceps, your diaphragm, so on and so forth. Yeah, these are the muscles that you're primarily using uh, for day-to-day -day activity. All right, when we're using neuromuscular blockade agents, they're also termed as paralytics or muscle relaxants. And they cause skeletal muscle weakness, paralysis, and they really are supposed to help prevent the patient from moving. Primarily, you would see these in places like general anesthesia. Uh, if someone has your uh, rib cage cracked open to do a heart surgery, you're not going to want to be moving because you don't want the surgeon to be trying to uh, work on a moving target there. So uh, they're ideally to help prevent moving. Uh, and that's also good because it also decreases oxygen consumption. When we paralyze someone, they're not moving their muscles. They're not using uh, their muscles of digestion either, right? So uh, they're using a lot less energy to be alive, and therefore that allows for, for a lot more oxygen to be left over to be delivered to the vital organs like the brain, the heart, you know, the kidneys, right? All those things. So we can easily use it in other scenarios where we can give them uh, a, a better chance of getting oxygen to the vital organs they need to go to. Especially in your ARDS patients, they might give this to them as well. And these drugs will cause skeletal muscle weakness or paralysis. Uh, so we see it most commonly in intubations. Uh, obviously, we don't want you moving around too much during intubation, surgery, uh, and synchronizing with the mechanical ventilation if it's severe enough. Uh, and then we're going to get into these two categories, which are uh, depolarizing and non-depolarizing. But when we're looking at this, they, pr they produce a paralytic effect on the neuromuscular junction by interfering with the action of ACH. So it interferes or changes the pathway of acetylcholine, changes the pathway of acetylcholine. And neuromuscular blockade agents are either depolarized at the presynaptic and postsynaptic membrane receptors. So they compete with acetylcholine. 
They compete with acetylcholine for binding to the HCH receptors at the neuromuscular junction. So it tries to beat it and park in the parking spot of the muscle site. So that way the muscle doesn't depolarize, right? So they depolarize the presynaptic and postsynaptic membrane to compete with the ACH. They're trying to battle for that parking spot, if you will. It's a massive parking battle, right? And their, their idea is to bind to that receptor site at that neuromuscular junction, so that way ACH can't, and therefore inhibits the ability to contract. So there's two types. There's depolarizing and non-depolarizing. And one of the things that we have an advantage here is we see a decrease in intracranial pressures. Uh, they're great for uh, things like status epilepticus as well when we're using these, uh, these paralytics. So there's a lot of advantages here. Physiology. Uh, physiology is going to be the big one. The muscle contraction may be blocked in the following of two ways. One is competitive inhibition. And the second one is prolonged occupation. So let's start with competitive inhibition. Uh, this one, it, it binds to the ACH receptor sites and it competes with acetylcholine, right? So this is the one that I was talking about where it competes for a parking space and parks in that space, right? Um, and this prevents the binding of acetylcholine. Uh, and, uh, and this is your non-depolarizing agent because it blocks depolarization, which prevents the muscle from contracting altogether. So that is how that one works. So this would be a non-depolarizing agent using competitive inhibition, right? Non-depolarizing agents use competitive inhibition. However, prolonged occupation, right? Prolonged occupation means that we have a persistent binding to the ACH receptors that results in sustained depolarization of the neuromuscular junction. This action, uh, this is the action of depolarizes, right? Depolarizing agents. So what they do is they block these ones, the prolonged occupation ones, block the nicotinic receptors. So ACH cannot bind and therefore causes paralysis. So it blocks them, and so it can't. It causes paralysis. Both depolarizing and non-depolarizing agents will resemble ACH, right? They're both going to look like ACH to that receptor site. However, they're not going to cause any effect on the ACH. So they have a very similar structure to acetylcholine. So when we're looking at prolonged occupation, uh, prolonged occupation would be the succinylcholine. Succinylcholine is the only depolarizing one. Succinylcholine would be the only depolarizing agent that we're seeing out there. Uh, so that's an example of that, but there's still rocuronium, there's still other um, medications that are paralytics out there, and we'll talk about that. Pancuronium, rocuronium, vecuronium, Nimbex, all those, rocuronium, pancuronium, uh, and uh, vecuronium and nimbex, all those would be this first one here, competitive inhibition or non-depolarizing agents. So most of your paralytics are non-depolarizing. However, you do have a depolarizing one, which would be succinylcholine. Succinylcholine would be the only one that uses prolonged occupation or depolarizing. So you should know which drugs are non-depolarizing and which one is depolarizing. So neuromuscular blockade agents are used for skeletal muscle paralysis in a lot of clinical situations. So when would I use this is what the question is. Uh, to facilitate intubation, we're traditionally looking at rapid sequence intubation. With most of these, you can do delayed sequence intubation with uh, paralytics, but uh, this one is most of the time going to be uh, rapid sequence intubation to help reduce the risk of aspiration. So we'll paralyze. We'll take away that gag reflex uh, so that way they don't aspirate if there's food in their stomach. Uh, we can use it to obtain muscle relaxation during surgery, uh, especially thoracic and abdominal surgeries. We don't want you moving while they're doing that procedure. That could be very harmful to yourself. Uh, to enhance ventilator synchrony if the patient is severe enough. Now, if the patient is just uncomfortable 
uh, with the breathing machine? Is that your indication to go ahead and push paralytics? No, I would make an argument against that. Uh, but if they're doing it to the point where they're causing harm to themselves, they're fighting the ventilator and there's nothing else we can do from our standpoints, then that is an option. But do not, do not think that this is a first line to get better patient ventilator synchrony. Uh, there's a lot of uh, effects that can go along with that as well, besides having to use heavy sedation, which could then cause things like ICU delirium, post-traumatic issues. Uh, then it can cause muscle atrophy, which makes it even harder for them to get off the vent and more likely to have respiratory failure and fatigue. Uh, there's so many issues with that. So that's not a, a trigger that you'll pull lightly. The next one here is to reduce intracranial pressures, especially for patients that have a, in, in a high intracranial pressures. Uh, so neuromuscular patients, uh, not neuromuscular patients, neurotrauma patients, uh, that could be a, a scenario where you see that more significantly. Uh, to reduce oxygen consumption, this is where I've seen it the most in my personal experience, uh, where we have a patient who's PF ratio, PO2 to FiO2 ratio. Let me just put that on the screen. PaO2 to FiO2 is one way to look at diffusion. And obviously in a syndrome like ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, you can see their PF ratios get really low. So if they're on 100% oxygen, and so that would be one, and then their PO2 is 50, well, their PF ratio is 50, and that's a severe situation. So how am I going to get more oxygen into their bloodstream so it helps their kidneys and their liver and their brain and their heart and all those things get the oxygen that they need to keep going? Well, one of the things I can do is reduce the metabolic consumption of oxygen. So if I paralyze your muscles, how much oxygen consumption are you going through with your quad muscle, with your hamstring, with your calf, with your, you know, all those other skeletal muscles? How much oxygen are they consuming after they're paralyzed? Well, they're going to consume a lot less oxygen. Your baseline metabolic rate should decrease. Therefore, you have more oxygen left over in your bloodstream for those vital organs like your brain, your heart, your liver, your kidneys, and so forth. So to reduce oxygen consumption is going to traditionally be a big indication for this in our uh, critical care context besides facilitating endo, uh, endotracheal intubation as well. Uh, ter terminating a convulsive status epilepticus or tetanus in patients, obviously that could be a good indication there. Uh, procedures or diagnostic studies, uh, surgical procedures or any diagnostic procedures to help the patient from harming themselves during it. And then patients who must remain immobile, immobile for different things like uh, trauma patients to help them uh, as they're working on them. So there, we're going to see a dose related response, especially I, with IV uh, uh, one. So uh, if we see uh, a paralytic, we, we can actually titrate how much paralysis we want uh, in there, and then we're going to use a train of four, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. You do need to know train of four for the board exams. They do ask you about that, and that's a way of seeing how much paralytic is on board. The most common situation that you will see this in uh, for our context is intensive care units, right? Intensive care units. Uh, so the number one use is in the OR for procedures, right? The number one use is in the OR for procedures. Um, but uh, the most common situations you will see is in ICU. And most of the time here, it's ventilated patients, obviously, because we're paralyzing them. So we have to breathe for them. And so it's uh, paralyzed patients that we're breathing for them that re need muscle relaxation, whether it's to increase oxygenation, right, to help reduce their baseline metabolic rate and therefore have more oxygen left over for the vital organs, or to help do things like with, with um, smooth muscle, with uh, airways, right, to help paralyze that so that way they can have better ventilation for something like a status asthmaticus. So, so patients with severe asthma could be obviously on this list with requiring muscle relaxation. They do, it does reduce oxygen consumption on these patients. So if we have trouble diffusing oxygen into the bloodstream, right, into the bloodstream, 
So one of the things we could do, instead of trying to increase pressure to get better oxygen diffusion, let's try to increase pressure to get better diffusion, what we could do is just decrease consumption by the muscles and so more oxygen's left over. So we can make whatever oxygen's getting into their bloodstream more efficient versus turning up ventilating pressures or volumes or anything like that. Uh, ARDS is traditionally where you're going to see this situation because of their PF ratio. Uh, their ability to diffuse into their bloodstream is very, very poor in ARDS. So that's where these neuromuscular blockades can be helpful. So that way we have a survivable PaO2. Um, patients requiring uncomfortable modes of ventilation such as PCIRV, uh, so pressure control invert inverse ratio of ventilation is pressure control IRV. So that's where I said PCRV, right? So PCRV is very similar to a mode called APRV. And PCRV does not allow you to breathe spontaneously. So let me draw a picture here, right? So here we have inverse ratio of ventilation. So let's say we have a, uh, a four to one ratio, four to one ventilation to oxygenation ratio. Right, so we're going to have this, short release, and then back up. But at this top part here, and this is a pressure time scaler. So let's say here the patient is not allowed to breathe spontaneously at this top pressure setting. So they're not allowed to breathe spontaneously up there, traditionally with PCRV. APRV they are. But if they're not allowed to breathe spontaneously, it's like you trying to take a deep breath in right now and hold it for five seconds, <gasps> right? And then exhale for a brief, short one second, <sighs> right? So when you're inhaling for that four seconds or five seconds, whatever your ratio is, it's going to feel very abnormal to breathe in for five seconds or four seconds and then exhale for one. And then five seconds, four seconds for inhale, and then exhale for one. So it's very uncomfortable. And so that's where you're going to have the patient fight against the ventilator if that mode doesn't allow for spontaneous breathing. And traditionally it didn't. So that's where we had to paralyze these patients. What about the depolarizing versus non-depolarizing agent? We've talked about this. Already there is uh, with competitive inhibition and so forth. Uh, the non-depolarizing agents have a longer duration of action. Longer duration of action for non-depolarizing. Longer duration of action for non-depolarizing. Usually the time of onset is one to one and a half minutes. Uh, and then it can last uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So a lot longer duration of action. Um, so these are better for your long-term paralytic use. So if we're going to paralyze someone for hours or days or whatever on mechanical ventilation, then that might be a better choice, like a Nimbex or Rockeronium, so on and so forth, Vecuronium. Um, but uh, especially Nimbex, uh, which is Atriconium, right, Nimbex, uh, which is a great one for that. But uh, when we're looking at the longer actions, uh, then they're going to be better for longer term situations. Shorter term, that's where succinylcholine could be an advantage there. So NMBAs are divided into two groups, depolarizing versus non-depolarizing. Non-depolarizing agents are steroid structure and they have quinoline esters, right? So steroid structure ones would be pancuronium, rocuronium, vecuronium. And then quinoline esters would be Nimbex, which is atricarium, right, Nimbex. Uh, so the big thing with those is duration is dependent on the dose. If we increase the dose, we'll have a longer duration uh, of, the, of the paralytic effect. We also have to watch out for how their kidney and liver function can also affect uh, the duration. So if someone's kidneys uh, are very poor in, in function, then if their ability to eliminate these from their system can be impeded. Uh, if their liver function is, is poor, that can really affect the elimination. However, I believe Nimbex, since it's equivalent ester, actually bypasses the liver. Uh, so if they have liver issues, that might be the paralytic or neuromuscular blockade agent of choice with that situation. All right, a little drug chart that you might see there. So depolarizing, 
uh, succinylcholine, right? Uh, and then finally, non-depolarizing, uh, we're seeing these here. Atricurium, which is Nimbex, uh, oh, cis, cis atricurium, sorry, Nimbex, uh, pancuronium, rocuronium, and vecuronium, right? And so we see the quinoline ester of Nimbex, which that's the one that has renal elimination. So we need to make sure that their kidneys are able to eliminate that because more of it could stay in their system. So they actually might be able to use a lower dose uh, on those patients. Um, uh, rocuronium has liver metabolism. So if they're in liver failure or vecuronium, liver metabolism, uh, metabolism and renal failure. So if they have those issues, then we need to be aware it could have a, a longer lasting effect than that 10 to 15 minutes on these patients. Uh, when we're looking at uh, NIMBEX, these are immediate, uh, intermediate acting uh, situations. Uh, vecuronium, vecuronium at the bottom there, has a very prolonged effect of, of uh, paralytics. So that's one that you could see same one on a vec drip, a vecuronium drip as well, but if they have liver issues, they might go to a Nimbex drip, which is more in, intermediate acting. Uh, pancuronium is very long acting. Very, pancuronium is very long acting uh, and is also renal eliminated. So just make sure that we're using the right dose and then we're making sure that the liver and kidney function is appropriate for the medications that utilize liver and kidney elimination. Depolarizing neuromuscular blood cade agents bind to the ACH receptor site and cause a sustained postsynaptic membrane depolarization. Uh, so that postsynaptic ending becomes refractory. It, it doesn't want to respond. Uh, it's unexcitable and it results in flaccid muscle. So succinylcholine is the only available agent in this depolarizing class. Um, depolarizing class, thanks succinylcholine. Uh, there are no reversal agents, no reversal agents for this one, but it's very short acting. Uh, but you do need to know how each category works. So uh, you do need to know that this is a depolarizing one versus how uh, Nimbex, pancuronium, rocuronium, vecuronium would be non-depolarizing. So you do need to know which ones are in which category, which ones are longer acting, which ones are prolonged or uh, intermittent acting, which ones are short acting, which would be your depolarizing like your succinylcholine. Non-depolarizing, they produce paralysis and muscle weakness by competing for the ACH for binding with the ACH receptor. So more drug equals more competition for these, uh, for these uh, and then that will create more paralysis. And that's where we'll look at muscle twitching with the train of four and we'll try to look at that picture. But uh, non, uh, they, they're really going to outnumber acetylcholine is the big thing. That's why the more drug, the better. Uh, these drugs chemically resemble acetylcholine uh, and that's one of the things that's gonna help us understand that. Uh, Non-depolarizing agents uh, block the depolarizing effect of ACH, thereby preventing muscle contraction. It, it competes for the parking spot, like what we talked about there. These ones can be reversed, right? I asked you this, the, the title slide, I said, hey, know which ones, if they can be reversed, what are they reversed by? Well, yes, it can be reversed, right? These non-depolarizing can be reversed. Neostigmine is going to be the big one. Neostigmine is going to be the big one. Uh, and they, it inhibits cholinesterase, which is the thing that breaks down acetylcholine and allows more acetylcholine to be available uh, at the neuromuscular junction to compete. So that's how neostigmine can reverse, uh, can reverse uh, non-depolarizing agents. Once again, it would inhibit color cholinesterase that would normally break down ACH. So then there's more ACH left over at the site. It allows more ACH to be available at the neuromuscular junction to compete. So if I give someone pancuronium, rocuronium, vecuronium, and for some reason we are having a hard time and we need to reverse it, then we can with the drug neostigmine, right? 
Uh, so it, it's going to be one of those things that inhibits cholinesterase to eat down acetylcholine. Uh, there's pyrostigmine that's also used in myasthenia gravis as well, which allows for uh, the ACH receptor site to have more stimulation for those patients. So pharmacokinetics, uh, these ones are given IV, almost always IV, because they have a very rapid, uh, rapid onset, uh, and then the more and their effects of and duration are dose dependent. What does it mean? It means that the more dose we give, the higher the dose we give, the longer the duration of the drug. So uh, they're poorly lipophilic, which doesn't store well in fatty tissue. Uh, which is a good thing. Uh, they're poorly absorbed in the GI tract. So that's why we traditionally give them IV. They do not cross the blood and brain barrier. Uh, they do start in one to two minutes, uh, and then the max process is in about two to 10 minutes. So usually we gotta wait a couple minutes for that maximum paralysis to kick in. And then one of the things that you'll see is blurred vision, droopy eyelids, uh, unable to talk, they can't move, or they stop breathing, they go apneic. Uh, recovery is in the opposite order. The eyes will actually open last uh, when we reverse this. And then pancuronium is the longest duration, and it's considered a long-acting neuromuscular blockade agent. Uh, when we're looking at this, adult patients will usually have a sympathomimetic response. So what does that mean to their heart rate? What does that mean to their blood pressure? So on and so forth, right? So expect a, a sympathomimetic response here. Uh, this is why a lot of the docs will ask what the patient's last potassium level is because muscle fasciculations can also cause an increase in serum potassium and CK, uh, creatinine phosphokinase, right? Uh, so when we're looking at this, uh, we need to make sure that they don't become hyperkalemic, right? Hyperkalemic, because what can hyperkalemia do to your EKG? Well, it can cause peak T waves, it can cause arrhythmias, it can cause a lot of issues with your cardiac function. So a lot of times with these, they'll ask what their last uh, potassium level is. So. The big things that you'd have to worry about then is hyperkalemia, that includes arrhythmias like we just talked about, and finally, cardiac arrest. And do you want to add that to this patient's profile? No, and that's why they want to check a potassium level, a serum potassium level too. Uh, when we see this, uh, there's an increase in intracranial pressure in patients with cerebral edema and head trauma um, by a mechanism that we really don't understand why that happens. But uh, one of the things that they can do uh, is look at uh, what we, what else, what other medications we can give uh, for those patients uh, when we have a cerebral edema condition. So that might be a situation where we use a non-depolarizing, or sorry, depolarizing agent. Malignant hyperthermia is a big concern. Um, these are uh, men are more likely to have this. Uh, Malignant hyperthermia happens when there is a release of histamines from the mast cells. When that causes bronchospasm and vasodilation and hypothermia, right? Sorry, hyperthermia. Uh, but uh, when we're looking at this, we can do things to help these patients. Uh, they're going to have a fast rise in temperature, severe um, contractions. They're going to be it's something that is passed down through family. So if you have someone in your family tree that has had this, that's something good to inform medical care about. There is a drug that we can use called dantrolene. I think I have it in here. Yeah, here it is, dantrolene, right? Uh, is treated with dantrolene, and it's an agent that blocks the release of intracellular calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So dantrolene blocks the release of intracellular calcium is the big thing. So it blocks the release of intracellular calcium that can help with these patients. Uh, so uh, malignant hyperthermia is a big thing. 
and then it's because of the big thing is the uncontrolled release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So if we give dantrolene, it blocks that release of intracellular calcium and therefore can help with malignant hyperthermia. And what do you see on these patients? Well, they're going to have muscle spasm, especially jaw muscles, rigidity. I've seen this where their jaw just becomes super tight. Uh, increased oxygen demand, right, because they're hypermetabolic, because they're hyperthermic, right? Uh, they can go into easy in a metabolic acidosis and tachycardia. So it's a pretty significant effect uh, when we give this. So watch out for that uh, malignant hyperthermia. Cardiovascular effects, it can produce a vagolytic effect when we give it. So watch out for low blood pressure. Watch out for the tachycardia. Uh, hypertension can happen as a, as a response. Vasoconstriction can happen as a response. Uh, repeated bolus doses of succinylcholine may actually produce a vagal response, which causes that vagal, that bradycardia or hypotension. So the, the, the moral of the story here is look out for any ad, ad unexpected responses. So if you start to see a tachycardia, uh, hypertension, vasoconstriction, or if you start to see that vagal response, which they brady down and their blood pressure drops out, you need to know. So this means we're going to have them on cardiovascular monitoring when we're giving these medications. Non-depolarizing agents can cause a histamine release. So what would you see with the histamine release? Well, the first one is going to be vasodilation. That vasodilation can easily cause hypotension on these patients. Obviously, tachycardia, they can go into bronchospasm uh, and be a lot harder to ventilate because their airway resistance, their raw, is going to be increased. So we're going to have a lot more issues there. So can a person require nebulized bronchodilators after giving a paralytic? Absolutely. So if you're having a hard time there, maybe we do need to give them something like a bronchodilator to help respond to that airway resistance. You might even see skin flushing as well. Uh, obviously with vasodilation, right, that skin flushing uh, can be an issue. So if you start to see their cheeks and their face turn red, that's a sign that they're experiencing that histamine release effect. Um, you may have to give the medication at a reduced rate or even lower doses to avoid these. Uh, antihistamines like Benadryl might be administered pre-treatment to avoid complications. So if you see them do uh, an antihistamine IV, that they're trying to avoid any potential uh, side effects from that. So non-depolarizing neuromuscular body blocking agents. Uh, include acetylcholine, uh, non-depolarizing uh, neuromuscular blocking agents, uh, ACH receptor sites, and cholinesterase. All these are important to look at. When we're looking at depolarizing neuromuscular blockade agents, they allow for depolarization of the muscle, which maintains a refractory state. Right, refractory state here. Uh, fasciculations are followed by flaccid paralysis. So that's why we'd look for fasciculations around the eyes before we'd start the intubation. These ones are shorter acting. Shorter acting. Uh, the onset's only 60 to 90 seconds, so about 10 to 15 minutes in duration. There is no reversal. There is no reversal here. Uh, and they are metabolized by pseudocholinesterase in the liver. So if someone has liver failure or liver damage or anything like that going on, it could last a little bit longer than that 10 to 15 minutes. All right, it could stay in their system a little bit longer. Uh, the drug of choice uh, for rapid sequence intubation here. So drug of choice for rapid sequence intubation would be your depolarizing neuromuscular blockade agent, which you know as succinylcholine. Succinylcholine. Uh, the leukotenic receptor sites are open uh, when they're in that refractory state, um, but succinylcholine is going to be the big drug of choice for your rapid sequence intubation. So it's great for short term situations. Uh, succinylcholine, also known as a nectine. Uh, some people will call it sucks. Can you grab them some sucks? You'll hear that. Uh, there was another one. So, Synco, synco urine, right? Uh, 
that one was there, but uh, the big one's going to be succinyl choline. There is no reversible, right? They're non-reversible, right? So be ready for a situation. Uh, uh, check your vents. Uh, make sure you're able to ventilate this patient. Uh, and make sure you can establish a patent airway. Uh, that's why they may do things like awake intubations where uh, they don't give paralytics in some scenarios. Uh, and they might just try to uh, use a lot of lidocaine to take the cough and gag reflex away if it's still there. Um, because that if their airway collapses on themselves, we're not going to be able to ventilate very easily. So you have to look at the scenario. We may not be able to use a paralytic. So we have to monitor them. We have to make sure that we have good vent settings. We have suction. We have our monitors, which include blood pressure, pulse ox, uh, EKG, end tidal CO2. We make sure we have our uh, airway equipment. So an oral or nasal airway, both face mask, and the tracheal tubes, our stylets ready to go, a laryngeal scope is working. Uh, make sure we have good IV access for giving the drugs and fluids. If we need to fluid, uh, give them a bunch of fluids. Uh, drugs include uh, uh, induction agents to help them with like Versed or fentanyl uh, to help them with uh, uh, that induction. Uh, muscle relaxants and drugs for resuscitation as needed that need to be ready to go because these drugs, this succinylcholine is non-reversible. So we gotta be ready to treat this patient very quickly. So adverse reactions to this include muscle soreness. Uh, muscle soreness is gonna be one of the big ones. Hyperkalemia, I will highlight here. Hyperkalemia, we talked about that, checking the patient's serum potassium level beforehand, uh, so hyperkalemia, uh, increased intraocular pressure, increased intracranial pressure, malignant hyperthermia is another one that I'm going to circle on purpose, not because I'm just doing random things, no, I'm doing it on purpose, and then rhabdomyolysis, right, that's that breakdown, and this one's not to be used under the children under the age of 12, no children under the age of 12 as well. Non-depolarizing agents uh, plus an uh, opioid uh, like propofol is usually what's used. Uh, so not, we don't use depolarizing on kids. We'll use non-depolarizing. So rocuronium, vecuronium, uh, Nimbex, so on and so forth. Those ones are the ones we'd use in pediatric patients under the age of 12. And an opioid of some sort, uh, but propofol is a very common uh, induction agent as well on those little guys. How do we choose the right paralytic? Well, it depends on the situation and the condition of the patient. So how do we choose it? So if we're going to do rapid sequence intubation or long-term mechanical ventilation use, uh, that's going to factor into which one we're going to use. Uh, other, uh, if we're going to do just a rapid sequence intubation, that's going to be our depolarizing succinylcholine. It's long term. It might be more of our pancuronium or you know rocuronium or Nimbex if they have liver issues. So we got to understand what's our goal with this: long term or short term paralysis. Do we want to be able to reverse it if we need to? So you might see them use a non-depolarizing for intubation if there's a patient that has a questionable airway. Let's say they have a large neck. Uh, then we might use a reversible agent for that situation uh, if we're having trouble and we lose their airway. Um, the next one's going to be the potential for histamine release, right? The potential for histamine release. Uh, and so a patient with increased airway resistance anyway, we're going to use one that, that won't do this. So we're going to use uh, a depolarizing. Uh, so we're going to try to make sure that uh, we're using one that's not going to potentially make them worse. Cardiovascular side effects is one of them too. Metabolic routes of how it's metabolized. Uh, so this is mo more important for patients that are already in uh, kidney failure, liver failure, multi-organ system failures, right? So metabolic route. So that's where I talked about Nimbex is a great long-term paralytic for a patient that has liver issues because it doesn't use it. It bypasses the liver, right? Cost is another factor as well. Um, but succinylcholine is traditionally 
only uh, good for intubation because it has such a rapid onset and short duration. Uh, Atricorium uh, nimbex is thought to trigger the release of even uh, the smallest histamine. So we have to watch out for different side effects and to determine which one is best for this patient. So that's why you're going to see a variety of uh, neuromuscular blockade agents in use out there. Uh, and that's primarily because each different situation uh, could, could uh, be a different uh, uh, indication for those drugs if they're in liver failure versus they're not. If we're doing short term versus long term, if we need to reverse it. So it's going to change it. So it's not like they're just saying random drugs. They're usually considering risk versus benefits of the different types of drugs before they go ahead and administer it. What about mechanical ventilation, especially prone? It really does help synchronize ventilation. Uh, when we put someone in prone, we don't have to paralyze you to put you in prone position. However, the study that, that got prone uh, back into FAD uh, really looked at uh, the patients that were in prone. They used higher doses of paralytics than the patients that were supine. Uh, and so paralytics really helped with those patients. Uh, but they will usually give neuromuscular blockade agents to those prone patients. Uh, it does show to improve oxygenation and ventilation, especially in your status asthmaticus patients where we're trying to paralyze those muscles and allow for a lot better ventilation. Uh, it's been helpful with epilepsy patients, tetanus patients, uh, and all those patients that have those different toxins there. Uh, if they're in pressure control inverse ratio ventilation, and then when they used to put adults on the oscillator, that's sort of a historical thing there, uh, unfortunately. Uh, they, it w they tried to do this because those modes are very uncomfortable for traditional breathing, and so they would do that to help prevent the patient from fighting against how those modes work, and therefore prevent an increase in work of breathing, which would increase their oxygen requirements and make their ventilation worse and increase anxiety. So if we actually paralyzed them, we take away those factors that would make them cause harm to themselves. Now in the oscillator patient, eight high frequency oscillating ventilation, uh, we don't usually paralyze those neonates either, right? We don't paralyze them, but adults, when we used to put them on, they would do a paralytic for them because of the uncomfortableness there. You do need to monitor your patient. You got to set very tight ventilating alarms, uh, low pressure alarms, especially low volume alarms, low minute ventilation alarms. Any of your low alarms, you set tight because if they become disconnected, they have no ability to breathe. Uh, so it should go without saying, but I'm not going to go without saying it because it's pretty darn important. Make sure your vent alarms are set tight, including your low tidal volume, low pressure, low minute ventilation, all those alarms are set tight. The other thing that you need to make sure is there's proper sedation and pain management. Uh, you can paralyze someone, but they're just paralyzed. They're still aware. Do they still have the ability to feel pain? Yes. So if we paralyze someone, we still need to give them pain control if they have a pain situation. Let's say it's someone that is in a severe ARDS after a car accident and all these bones are broken, right? They're going to be in a lot of pain and we give them paralytics, but so their pain is still there. So we still need to give them uh, pain control management. We still need to give them sedation to help uh, deal with being on mechanical ventilation. So just because someone's paralyzed doesn't mean they don't feel pain or that they don't need sedation. And in fact, quite the opposite is true. If they're paralyzed, they can't tell you they, they're in pain, right? Uh, so that's where we have to look at uh, our objective vital signs like uh, heart rate and blood pressure. If they start getting high, that's a sign it could be anxiety or pain. So we need to make sure sedation is a big part of this. Another thing you have to be very careful of when you use neuromuscular blockade is airway clearance therapy. And I know I cir circled suction. I am a big uh, opponent, not proponent, but opponent of something called deep suctioning. And you guys know that of me. But uh, airway clearance therapy is what I would like to put there. Uh, airway clearance therapy. Uh, because what's going to happen is what happens to the mucociliary escalator? It's paralyzed. The cilia are paralyzed. So their ability to clear secretions is severely inhibited. So that's going to really lead to things like mucus plugging on the ventilator. So we've got to be very careful 
of that. So airway clearance therapies that it can include metaneb, IPV, uh, vest, right? You name it, bronchoscopies. I've seen them do bronchoscopies for airway clearance, right? We got to be very cognizant of that airway clearance. Uh, for these patients because their ability to move secretions out of the airway, it's been paralyzed. Another thing we got to watch out for is the range of motion. Make sure that we're turning the patient uh, because they can't move themselves and that's going to be good for their skin, it's going to be good for their their uh, muscles and uh, their, their physical condition as well. It'll help with drainage, right, pulmonary drainage. So this is one of those things that helps include uh, airway clearance therapy. So I'd like to replace suction with airway clearance therapy. Because suction, I don't believe in stabbing carina with each time you go, right, that's my whole thing. There's evidence that supports me, so I'm going by that evidence, uh, but uh, make sure airway clearance therapy is something you think about. Otherwise, you could see issues with mucus plugging. So good humidity, good systemic hydration. Uh, uh, Pharmacoconnects, you could nebulize different stuff, but the cilia are paralyzed. So uh, something like metaneb, something like the vest, something that can mobilize secretions, uh, including bronchoscopy, as long as the ICPs are appropriate, uh, could be a, a better route than just trying to suction. Because can suction create more secretions? Oh, yes, it can, especially if you're stabbing things in there. All right, let's talk about inadequate ventilation. Adequate airway control uh, and ventilatory support are required until muscle recovery is adequate for spontaneous ventilation. That's one of the concerns that you have when we're using paralytics is how long, how much atrophy are you causing uh, on this patient. Now, keeping them alive is going to be one of the primary things. Keeping good adequate oxygen delivery to the brain is going to be a primary uh, factor that we have to keep going. But uh, until we uh, get them, once we get them there, we got to understand that we caused a lot of atrophy and so that could delay this person from being able to weave weaned off the ventilator. So they could need things like tracheostomy, they could need long-term acute care ventilation, right? So they could uh, potentially go there for long-term weaning because they have to build up that muscle again. Uh, close patient machine monitoring is essential. Uh, obviously, the big thing is preventing hypoxemia and hypoventilation. The patient cannot breathe over. They can't breathe on their own above the machine. So we got to watch their arterial blood gases. We got to watch their alarms. We got to make sure that we're monitoring their blood CO2 and O2 levels. Ventilator dyssynchrony can cause an increase in pressure uh, uh, and then cause a uh, uh, decrease in alveolar ventilation and make them work hard to breathe. So if we're trying to reduce their work of breathing, well, that's where uh, it could help with that uh, there. Uh, but that traditionally that wouldn't be used unless it was an extreme case. Uh, and even then uh, we have other things. But the big goal with these drugs is to improve ventilation, to improve ventilation and oxygenation, right? And then the other thing would be to help reduce ventilation pressures. And that's why with this last goal in mind, you're gonna see this primarily with patients that have acute respiratory distress syndrome. Acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, it can be helpful with ARDS, right? That's what I just said there. The next one would be your status asthmaticus. Uh, these patients have that severe bronchospasm that's going on, uh, severe bronchospasm. And what we're trying to do is help with improve, not only decreasing oxygen requirements, but help uh, with the paralytics of that airway muscle, right? So that airway smooth muscle can be paralyzed and that will allow for a lot better ventilation. And therefore, once we get rid of CO2 with better ventilation, better oxygenation as well. And then are they working against the ventilator? Are they working as hard to breathe when we paralyze them? No, by definition, they can't. So that can also help there too and take that workload. Uh, there are certain modes of ventilatory support like PCRV, pressure control and inverse ratio ventilation, or high frequency oscillation ventilation in the adults, which at the point of this, there was that study. I won't comment on how terrible that study was. But anyway, there was a study, and right now, adults on oscillator as of recording this aren't a thing. But uncomfortable modes like PCRV, which is still used, PCRV is still used in the adults, 
uh, is when you would bring it, that out as well. Uh, if a patient's having an epileptic episode, so that's epilepticus, uh, or uh, convulsing, right? Uh, that convulsing activity, then the paralytics will stop that convulsing. Uh, neuromuscular toxins, if they have some, any types of poisoning or tetanus, it can really help with those patients. But patients with status asthmaticus and those with ARDS, patients requiring PCRV, um, or if we're trying to just decrease peak airway pressures uh, and that are causing dyssynchrony, right? We have massive dyssynchrony, let's say it's a neurotrauma patient, then that, the paralytics could be helpful with those patients. Precautions. Uh, the big uh, one to look at first, and you're going to see this in the OR, you're going to see this in the ICU, is eye care. So traditionally, they're actually going to close their eyes. They'll put drops or a gel in there, and then they'll tape their eyelids shut. And they're trying to prevent uh, corneal abrasions, corneal abrasions. So uh, when you blink your eye, it lubricates, it cleans, right? And corneal drying and ulceration can occur where this doesn't happen. So they try to lubricate the eyes, right? And prevent, cor uh, and then light taping, right? You're gonna see that little plastic tape over their eyes and that prevents corneal abrasions. So if you see their eyes taped closed, that's a sign they're probably under paralytic. So you'll see that for general anesthesia surgeries, and you'll see that in, in the intensive care unit as well. Uh, the cough reflex is inhibited, so you got to be careful uh, on these patients uh, because there's no airway clearance uh, that they can currently do, and their ciliar motility is paralyzed as well. So they're more prone to things like pneumonia. They're more prone to mucus plugging. So we've got to look at airway clearance therapy, proper hydration, proper humidification, uh, as well. If we don't have proper humidification, uh, then they're very prone to mucus plugging. Uh, so we need to be very careful with these patients. Uh, suction assessment, uh, that doesn't mean stabbing carina. That means making sure the airway is patent and clear of secretions. Uh, and like I said, this is where uh, I would look for airway clearance therapy on these patients. Make sure you got adequate heated humidity on them. Make sure you got good systemic hydration on them. Those are things that we need to be very cognizant of when a patient is under paralytics. Retention of secretions is thought to increase the cause of a nosocomial pneumonia in patients receiving a paralytic for a prolonged period of time. So airway clearance therapy, I think, is a very, very beneficial thing. I was always a huge fan of metadeb in line with mechanical ventilation, uh, and it, it can be done so. Uh, and there's other methods of airway clearance therapy as well besides suctioning, which can create more secretions and it creates trauma. And it, uh, yeah, don't even get me started there. But uh, elevating the head can also reduce the risk of aspiration. That's why you usually see uh, these patients head to bed at 30 degrees. Um, which is a risk factor for ventilator-associated pneumonia or ventilator-acquired conditions. So they try to keep their head a bit at 30 degrees unless there's hemodynamic uh, reasons not to. But other than that, we try to keep their head a bit up to help prevent them from a nosocomial ventilator-associated pneumonia. We should closely monitor for extubation and ventilator malfunction. So we need to make sure we set our low pressure alarms, right? We need to make sure we set our low volume alarms, low pressure alarms, low minute ventilation alarms. Uh, we need to set those tight to make sure that the patient is safe. Because uh, if we don't set those tight and that patient were to somehow have a leak and hy start hypoventilating, they can't compensate. Their brainstem can fire, but they, they're not going to be able to tell their muscles. The efferent signal is not going to be reaching the muscles to say, okay, start breathing more, right? They can't. Uh, so the alarm systems to detect hypoventilation and hypoxemia are standard of care. So this is where I'd love to talk about end tidal CO2. Pulse oximetry is great, but traditionally hypoventilation, do you think you're going to see that with end tidal CO2? Absolutely, right? Uh, other th precautions to be worried about is uh, prolonged skeletal muscle weakness, which usually leads to atrophy. Uh, atrophy is going to be your biggest concern. So are these patients going to be able to be weaned right away if they were on a paralytic for a couple weeks straight? No, probably not, right? There's a lot of atrophy, and I think the diaphragm loses, uh, it atrophies at 1% a day, 
uh, in critical care medicine. I'm pretty sure there's a couple of studies that back that up. But uh, so these patients might need uh, tracheostomies. They might need uh, prolonged uh, mechanical ventilation because of this long atrophy that happened. And they might need that long-term weaning like a long-term acute care center can provide as well. They need to be turned frequently to prevent decubitus ulcers. So they need to be uh, moved, uh, not only to prevent ulcers, but we also need to move their endotracheal tube and do oral care each time. And that can be very helpful in helping prevent a further infection if they don't already have one. A uh, DVT prophylaxis is pretty important. So they have those little SCDs that squeeze the legs or you'll see them put on the TED hose, right? The compression stockings. Those things that really help prevent them from getting a deep vein thrombosis, which then hopefully would help prevent uh, down the road a pulmonary embolism or stroke or any of those bad things as well. Uh, adequate, it's in bold here, adequate sedation. Uh, and for analgesia for vented patients receiving a blood agent. It's cruel to be paralyzed and aware. Uh, so that's where if you're under paralytic, we need to make sure that you're also under heavy sedation. So we got to be careful here because heavy sedation can cause ICU delirium uh, and a whole bunch of other things. So these patients, does it mean you, you, you shouldn't talk to these patients when you're in a room? No, I mean, unless there's a situation where we're trying to keep their brain from being active, like a, an ICP patient room, unless that situation's going on where they're like, be quiet in there because it causes their ICPs to go up. Unless that situation is happening, then you need to still talk to your patient, introduce yourself, tell them who you are, where you're at. You don't know, they're, they could be in a stressful state and they just they can't show it because they're under paralytic, right? So be that calming presence when it's appropriate. And finally, muscle paralysis without affecting the consciousness or the perception of pain. So what does this mean? Uh, uh, this means that we have to worry about them, uh, about them still having things like pain. Uh, they, they, they can easily have uh, a toxicity uh, as well. So we, we've got to be careful uh, uh, that we can uh, have a patient that's paralyzed, but fully aware of everything that's going on. They can't tell us they're in pain. So we need to look for signs of pain. We need to understand the scenario. Could they, could they be in pain? Because uh, otherwise it would be a very traumatic uh, situation for them. So a neuromuscular blockade is unthinkable without proper sedation. I'm gonna control that, right? Neuromuscular blockade is unthinkable without sedation and proper pain control. Uh, so the big thing is we need to prevent full consciousness uh, when the patient's this, because they're going to have that perception of being aware but can't move, and that's very, very inappropriate for patients. So it's inappropriate to reduce or discontinue sedation in analgesia while the patient is paralyzed. So we need to make sure when we take them off of sedation, do a sedation vacation, uh, that might be a situation where we also have to take them off of paralytics, right? Obviously, because we can't have them paralyzed and fully aware. Uh, so how do we know? Signs of restlessness, distress, anxiety are lost with the neuromuscular blockade. So the only way we can really tell is their heart rate and their blood pressure going up. So if we start to see the heart rate and blood pressure, blood pressure start to go up, that could be a sign they're in pain or they're aware and they're scared, right? It's an anxiety situation. So we gotta watch their vital signs. Uh, tachycardia, hypertension, they could still sweat, they could still have tears, right? Uh, so we have to worry about that uh, when we're seeing this. Factors that potentiate neuromuscular blockade um, or augment the effect of neuromuscular blockade. I know you're like, I wanted to use the word potentiate today. Now you have. Um, <laughs> so they augment the effect. Uh, acidosis, hypokalemia, uh, hyponatremia, uh, so low sodium, hypocalcemia, low calcium, hypomagnesia, right? Uh, and alkalosis and hypercalcemia inhibit the effect of the blockade. So that's why acidosis uh, and hyper uh, calcemia. 
or kalemia will increase the effect of it. So why are we using it? Why are we using a neuromuscular blockade? Uh, the depolarizing agent succinylcholine is well suited only for intubation. So when you see succinylcholine, think about intubation. Now, can we use other drugs, the, the non-depolarizing ones for intubation? Yes, but traditionally that's where it's best suited is for intubation because of its rapid onset and short duration of action, right? Right, rapid uh, onset, short duration action. This slide is very important to know. I will ask you to recall information from it. Uh, it we see prolonged process with non-depolarizing agents, and these ones are more suitable for long durations of action, like uh, patients on prolonged mechanical ventilation, surgical procedures, things like this. And these ones can be reversed, right? You should know which drug reverses it. You should know which drug reverses non-depolarizing agent. You should know which drug reverses non-depolarizing agents. There's a lot uh, fewer hemodynamic changes with these, with the Nimbex, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and then they are more of a gradual onset, uh, and then uh, we can take them on and off a lot easier. So important uh, slide to pay attention to, especially this whole neostigmine thing that helps reverse these non-depolarizing agents. Most non-depolarizing agents will release a histamine from the mast cells, so you got to watch out for bronchospasm. Uh, Atrocuticarium will stimulate the most histamine and cause bronchoconstriction, so should you still listen to the breath sounds? Absolutely, right? It makes you look like you're doing something at minimum. But, uh, yeah, listen, uh, is there increased airway pressures? Are they wheezing, right? Is there signs of a bronchospasm that are going on? Is there flow volume loop showing a scoop, right? Uh, is there PV curve showing a hysteresis, right? Are we seeing an increase in peak airway pressures, the plateau pressures staying the same? Those would all be signs of that increased airway resistance. Uh, uh, Vecuronium, rocuronium, cisatricurium, which is Nimbex, are similar to pancuronium and have minimal histamine release, right? Minimal histamine release. So these are great for uh, asthma and COPD patients on the ventilator. Rocuronium has little cardiovascular effect, but can increase pulmonary vascular resistance. So they're good for uh, CHF, core pulmonale, but bad for pulmonary hypertension patients or patients with uh, P uh, PEs, right? So we got to look at that uh, with rocuronium. Uh, I'm not going to want to use rocuronium with a pulmonary hypertension patient or a patient that has PEs uh, on their CT scan, right? But if I have a patient that has poor pulmonale and congestive heart failure, that might be a great patient for it. Uh, but uh, when we're looking at this last part, agents that depend on the liver and kidney for elimination are poorly suited for patients uh, with disease uh, organs, right? So there's pros and cons, right? Liver and kidney failure, uh, when we use uh, cisatricurium, atricurium, are good for cirrhosis, right? So Nimbex is great for cirrhosis because it doesn't have to deal with the liver, right? So know what you're looking at here, right? Uh, they, the, this drug, Nimbex, right, does not have to rely on the hepatic metabolism or renal excretion. So that's where, like I said, I've seen that drug used quite a bit because a lot of our adult patients had some liver issues in their history. Myopathy is a big one, right, on um, patients receiving uh, neuromuscular blockade agents because atrophy, they're not using their, their muscles, uh, not only their muscles to walk, right, their arms and leg muscles, the arms to move, legs to move, coordinating their core, but also because they're not using their diaphragm, and the diaphragm is going to also atrophy. And like I said, diaphragm atrophies the most. You'll lose diaphragmatic function 1%, atrophies at 1% a day uh, when it's not used. That's why daily wean trials are important, even if we're not going to extubate a patient. Should you try wean wean trial when a patient's on a paralytic? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, you'll figure that out yourself, I guess. Uh, myopathy is another thing that we have to worry about uh, with corticosteroid use, right, uh, as well. If we see these, um, especially if we use corticosteroids with our ARDS patients or our status asthmaticus patients, right? 
So the action potential can inc uh, is increased in patients receiving corticosteroids. So watch out, watch out. Uh, agents such as VEC, uh, pancuronium, rocuronium are a steroid structure, and they might actually prolong muscle weakness further uh, when we're looking at them. And non-steroid structured agents such as atricurium or cisatricurium, which is Nimbex, right? If you're like, which drug is that? That's Nimbex, right? Uh, they might be better for patients requiring high dose of corticosteroids, right? So if we have this asthmatic patient that we're giving high dose of corticosteroids to or ARDS patients that we're doing that to, uh, that's where that medication actually might be more handy. So look at your reason. What 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 reason are we giving the neuromuscular blockade? If it's this fast asthmaticus patient, maybe, especially for a prolonged, maybe that's what we're doing there, right? Pancuronium, uh, especially if tachycardia is not a concern, we can use that. Vecuronium is good for patients with ischemic cardiovascular issues because it lasts longer, um, longer with uh, prolonged, and, it, and it's prolonged with hepatic failure. So we've got to worry about liver failure causing any issues on these patients. So patients with hepatic and renal dysfunction, uh, Nimbex, Cisatricurium, or Atricurium are the best option. Uh, pancuronium, here, this is this fourth bullet point. Pancuronium uh, provides the least expensive option if we're looking at cost for prolonged paralysis of patients who are hemodynamically stable, so they can't have low blood pressures, which that throws out a lot of your uh, ARDS patients traditionally and cardiac patients, and with no organ dysfunction. So uh, a lot of our ARDS uh, patients have both of those, hemodynamic instability and poor organ dysfunction. So that's why you're usually going to see that uh, Nimbex strip, that cystachycurium, right, uh, be used pretty frequently there. Uh, unstable patients, uh, Vecuronium will produce the least amount of histamine release. So if that's the biggest concern is the histamine release, then there we go. We can use the Vec drip or Vecuronium. Uh, and then it has the fewest cardiovascular side effects too. So uh, that's where you'll see those Vecuronium drips or Vecuronium administration. Non-depolarizing agents are preferred for paralysis of vented patients because they're very predictable, right? They have a long lasting because we're traditionally doing it for a long use. Uh, we can manage the side effects uh, pretty easily on these and they, can they be reversed? Yes, that neostigmine can reverse them. So we're using these specific agents to uh, on the, based on the potential for the histamine release, cardiovascular uh, effects, or even the pathway, the metabolic pathway, like liver failure or renal failure or liver elimination, uh, renal elimination, right, or liver metabolism. So that's why how we're making our choice. Or we're making our choice, right? This is that bullet point slide. The or making our choice based on the potential for histamine release, right? Like what we just talked about with um, uh, vecuronium, uh, so, or based on the potential for their metabolic pathway, like uh, bypassing the liver, we see with cisatricurium or uh, Nimbex, right? Or anything else, the cardiovascular effects for patient, which would be your vecuronium patients, right? So uh, that's where we're looking at, okay, what's the situation and that's going to determine which paralytic we're going to use because we're going to try to mitigate side effects as much as possible. Because remember, the Hippocratic Oath is first, do no harm. All right, you got this patient on a paralytic, and now we're going to monitor them. So what do we monitor? Well, we need to monitor them from clinical signs and symptoms. Uh, can be masked by paralysis, so we need to monitor them, understanding that they can't give us as much information. So alarm systems are going to make sure that we need to look at them for hypoventilation. Uh, so set your low pressure, low tidal volume alarms, but also monitoring them, knowing that they can't tell you any information, it becomes more detailed, right? You're going to have to set your alarms tight. Um, detecting hypoventilation and hypoxemia are standard of care. So make sure you set your low saturation, your low tidal volume, your low end tidal CO2, all the low things, set them tight, right? Uh, you can look at their muscle activity is the simplest means of monitoring the blockade. 
And this can include looking at their train of bore, which we'll talk about in a couple slides here. Uh, skeletal muscles can be monitored physically. Uh, first, small rapid moving muscles such as the eyelids, uh, then the face, the neck, extremity, uh, abdomen, intercostals, and finally the diaphragm. Those are the muscles that would be uh, available. So when we're monitoring the skeletal muscles when they're paralyzed, uh, that remember, they recover the eyes last. So if you see their eyes start to open, which if they're taped shut, you probably might not see that. But uh, if you start to see all these other muscles twitching, that could be a sign that uh, their paralytics are very low level or they run out of it. So the first thing you would see is small, rapid moving muscles. Uh, the eyelids are last, right? But, uh, and look for their intercostals, the diaphragm, anything else, if you start to see that, uh, that recovery of paralysis, uh, you're going to start to see the eyelids last. And so look for all those muscles. Are they contracting in their muscles? If they're not, that's a sign that they might still be under that paralytic effect. Um, you do need more physiologic objective evaluation of neuromuscular blockades. Can be achieved by using a method such as nerve stimulation. Uh, which we'll talk about next. Nerve stimulation includes a single twitch, double burst, train of four, and tectonic and post-tectonic uh, uh, count. And so the train of four is the big one. They like to ask this on your board exam, so we'll talk about that. Um, the most common nerve used when they're doing the train of four is the ulnar nerve, right? And then we're looking at the thumb, twitching right and then if you have time right now to pause this and go look up a train of four video do it because uh, uh, you'll see that thumb twitch and that's what they're looking at there um, so peripheral nerve stimulation to monitor um, a muscle or twitch monitoring of the muscles is used uh, as a monitoring tool to see uh, to look at the effect and the toxicity uh, of these patients so uh, nerve stimulation is applied to the peripheral nerve. Like I said, the ulnar is the one that we use here. Uh, and then we're going to see the, the twitch response of the corresponding muscle. The amount of paralysis increases, the strength and degree of the movement of the twitch decreases. So if we increase stimulation, increase stimulation, we keep increasing stimulation, we don't see an effect then the person's under very heavy dose. Uh, if we uh, do some low stimulation, and the thumb starts to twitch almost right away, that means their paralytic uh, is very light. So the most commonly used technique is the train of four. Or the train of four. We're going to usually start at a stimulus frequency of two hertz. Uh, and traditionally, it's the nursing staff that will do the train of four or the physician staff. Uh, but I want you to understand this because uh, you are part of that care team taking care of that, that patient. Um, stimuli de delivered in four pulses every half second. So the number of twitches that occur ranges from zero um, uh, to four. So 100% blockade, which means there is no moving whatsoever. Or four means there's less than 75% of the blockade going on. So this is also another way we can uh correlate how much of a dose to use on these patients uh, so that way we're not having to guess and giving them too much of the drug. Uh, we can compare the strength of the fourth twitch with the first twitch which looks at how much of the receptor sites are occupied. Uh, so the degree of block, this is the big one to pay attention to down here, the degree of block can be determined by the counting of the number of switches seen. So uh, we, if we see all the twitches there, then obviously we don't have as much of a block. Uh, and so that patient, especially if we're titrating down the, the dose, then we're looking better there. There are four equal twitches indicates that 75% of the receptors are occupied with a blocker, right? 75% of them are occupied with a blocker. If only three twitches, then 80% uh, of the receptors are blocked. If there's only one or two seen, then 90 to 95 percent of the receptor sites are blocked. So that's how we can see how much blockade we have on board. So if we see only one twitch out of all four pulses, that means we still have a high amount of blockade on board. If we see four twitches, then we only have three quarters of the sites blocked. 
So this can be used to titrate up or titrate down when we're looking at it. So proper placement is the big thing. It should be checked every two to three hours. Uh, you should check this every two to three hours. I'll repeat that a third time if you get my hint. Should be checked every two to three hours. And what it does is it evaluates the conduction of impulses across the neuromuscular junction. So if the pads are placed directly on the muscle, the patient falsely exhibits inadequate paralysis, which means uh, you have to do a higher than necessary dose of paralytic. So that's why it's important you put it in the right place. Uh, so changes in the condition, like third spacing in a circle where the whole body is just third space, limit the ability to test this. So you need to look at other things as well. But your, your goals are going to be the big one to pay attention to here. Your predefined goals, uh, such as lower oxygen requirements, uh, lower PIPs, peak airway pressures, um, lower use of PEEPs, right? That can be uh, a beneficial there. Uh, reduction should uh, be assembled frequently. So we're looking at what are the effects? So we should be titrating these in paralytics with the same time. So we try to reduce all the settings and meds at the same time because one can impact the other for sure. If it is possible, of that lesser degrees of blockade may achieve the, the, the goal of ventilator synchrony, improved oxygenation. So do we have to have a train of four where we only see one or two twitches to get good ventilator synchrony? No, we could have four twitches and still get good ventilator synchrony. Only use what you need to use. If there is no twitch response, if there is no twitch response, uh, this means uh, that we have to worry about uh, the drug being too high, and we should decrease the dosage by 10%. Uh, 10%. So if three or four twitches occur without adequate response, then the dose can be increased by 10%. So we're just doing small 10% changes here. The need for the process to keep on going uh, should be assessed daily. Uh, is it appropriate for them to still be on there? and discontinue it as soon as possible because what are some of the harms and side effects? Well, A, uh, deep sedation, possible ICU uh, delirium, uh, uh, anxiety, uh, the inability to determine if they're in pain or not. Uh, we can also cause uh, muscle atrophy, uh, a lot of other issues with the side effects of just the medication alone besides just being paralyzed. So we need to talk about this at uh, rounds, right? Whenever you go to round with the physicians, uh, this is something that you need to talk about. Is the paralytics appropriate? When you're giving report, uh, that should be one of your questions. Is it appropriate for this patient to still be on paralytics? If so, why, right? Uh, so that's something we need to make sure to take off as soon as possible. And then titrating that drug and monitoring the reversal are performed with the train of four stimulation. So that train of four, becomes fairly valuable when we're looking at this whole situation. So you do need to know what train of four means when we would use it. Uh, that will be on your boards. It will be on a future assessment document if you hear what I'm saying there. Um, go back and make sure you understand your key terms like fasciculation, uh, uh, what ACH is and what does it work, uh, what patient population, status asthmaticus, status epilepticus. I know it sounds Harry Potter, but uh, what, 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 what drugs would you, what types of, of paralytics are there uh, between short acting, which ones are long acting, which ones are depolarizing, which ones are non depolarizing, which ones are good for patients with cardiovascular issues, which ones are good for patients with uh, liver issues, and we need long term uh, with that. Can any of these paralytics be reversed? If they can be reversed, which category and what drug is used to reverse them? Um, how do they work, right? Competitive inhibition versus prolonged occupation. Uh, what, what areas are you most likely going to see these paralytics be worked? Um, when you're looking at pancuronium, rocuronium, vecuronium, uh, tell me about malignant hyperthermia. What causes it and how do we treat malignant hyperthermia? What's the deal with asking about a potassium level on a patient? All right. What's with the histamine response? And if they do have a histamine response, what, 
can we pre-treat to prevent it? Uh, what happens, is there a vagolytic effect or hyper or a sympathomimetic effect with these or both, right? Uh, when we're looking at these, uh, uh, what about kids under the age of 12? Should we use depolarizing or non-depolarizing with kids under the age of 12 uh, for intubation or any other thing? So what do we do with our alarms? Uh, how do we monitor these patients uh, for uh, pain and sedation when they're on this. So uh, how, what are some different precautions that we have to be careful of? Uh, what about airway clearance therapy? Is that a, a, a discussion here? And how would we help with their airway clearance if they're on these neuromuscular blockades? How, do we, how often should we assess their train of four? Uh, sh how often should we assess their need for neuromuscular blockade agents? So these are all questions that you should be able to answer after going through your notes and going through this information.